Welcome to springtime. First of March. Can you believe it? We say that the winter is over on the 1st of February for St. Bridget's Day is like the, the beginning of springtime. But even if you, if, you, if you don't go with that, if you think that February is still winter, you do have to admit that by the time it gets to this precious day, the 1st of March, we're there. And the birds, the birds will be singing, and the birds will be chirping away, and the birds will be making their nests. You'd want to be happy on a, on the 1st of spring. You'd want to be happy on the 1st of March. There's an awful lot of stuff in the world that make you unhappy. You know? Like it bombards you. And I think the funny thing is that as you get older, you're more you're more kind of detached from the energy of the world. There's a natural progression that happens in life. I think that as you get older, a sort of a, a solitude grows inside you, a, a, an equanimity as well. All the stuff you do in religion to try and um, awaken yourself, all the things you do in therapy and in wellness to awaken yourself, they probably don't do any more than life does in itself. I mean, take take a couple of very basic ideas like, you know, exercise, good sleep, and a sense of humour. Those were three that Jonathan Swift used to recommend. A sense of humour, exercise, and sleep. And I'd say that If you did those well, you'd find that you'll also become enlightened. Without any exercise, like without any religious stuff, without any therapeutic stuff. Now you may have, you see, you may have interventions that are needed and that's a good way to look at it. Health will be fine if you exercise, but then you might have something happens where you need a surgical intervention or a medical or a chemical intervention, you get a particular illness, okay. And it would be it would be the same way that you might think about therapy that that there are interventions needed. You know, you have a blockage, an emotional blockage because you're stuck in the past because there's something is not resolved. It's as simple as that. You know, there's a story about, I often tell the story about the two monks. And they were on a big long walk and they came to a river. They were on their way home, let's say, and they came to this river and there was a woman. And she said, will you take me across the river because it's too deep for me. And uh, the first fella didn't know what to do. He was a young fella and he was a bit scared. And the older fella said, sure, hop up on me back there, daughter. And she hopped up on his back He took her across the river, he let her down, and on they walked. And after a while, maybe an hour or so passed, and the old fella says to the young fella, you're very quiet, you're saying nothing. And the young fella said, well, you know, when we were there at the river, you took that young woman up on your back, and that's against the rules. And the old monk said, well, now it may be against the rules, but I put her down an hour ago and you're still carrying her. That's an old Buddhist story. I I don't know what it's about. It's about a hundred things. You know, stories stories are opaque. Stories are not just about one thing. They're about, they're like a thing that you can look at from a whole lot of different points of view and 
one of the ways of looking at that story is that it's about how you have a blockage in your life. Could be to do with abuse or something wrong or terrible that was done to you in the past as a young person. And you're carrying it. And you continue to carry it hours later, but years later. Until it's resolved. And what therapy does for many people is that it gives them an opportunity through conversation, through reflection, through linguistic articulation. It gives them a chance to, if you like, revisit that moment and to to experience it not with the kind of emotional capacity that you had back then when it was happening to you but with a new kind of strength of consciousness that is sustained and you know held together with the, the care and skill of a good therapist and um, so you're able to kind of walk through it again and and let it go, you know. Like like imagine the young monk in the story going for therapy. And he's saying to the therapist, you know, um, I don't get on well with me with me boss man, the senior monk. I don't like him. And and he'd have to go through layers and layers of therapy to find out well what what really is the issue. And eventually, after a couple of hours of therapy, he might say, well, there was one morning we were walking home. And the old fella did this. And I thought it was wrong now because, you know, you can't be carrying young women on your back. You might get excited. And so so he's walking through it again, right? And he's, he's living through it in a way that he's conscious. He's in control, if you like. And he's able to resolve it. He's able to see why he can move on. Moving on might be understanding the other person's point of view. It might be, in in the case of the monk, he might realise, well, the old, old guy had a, a deeper and wiser sense of detachment than I have. He may become more aware that he was just obsessing on the sexuality of the young woman because he was worried about sexual matters or because he wasn't quite able to handle the monastic life without a partner. There, there might be loads of, or in other situations, obviously, you come to a point that was in the past and it, you're holding it like a lump in your heart all the time. But then when you go to therapy and you kind of explore it, you find that some profound wrong was done to you some some evil was was done and one of the pathways that you'll find in that moment is forgiveness so forgiveness becomes a huge aspect of of therapy that that the word people use you know helping you resolve something very often helping you resolve something involves a moment of acknowledgement and articulation of the wrong that's done to you and and the sense of the other person having done something terribly bad, but also a sense of forgiveness so that you can move on. And uh, that's therapy. It's like what I'm saying overall is that if you live a healthy life physically, good good exercise, if you sleep well at night, if you have a sense of humor, that's a hugely underrated thing at the moment because we have tied humor into sort of political satire, laughing at people. But I might come back to the idea of humor some some other time in some other podcast 
just for now I'm saying that a sense of humour is a profound thing and it can get you through life. And good physical exercise can get you through life. And good sleep can get you through life. Now last night I slept well. Two nights ago I didn't sleep well. Two nights ago I decided I wasn't going to drink for this week. This is Friday. I I decided on Sunday. I was socialising for one or two nights and then I thought, you know, I'll have no drink now for the week because I have work to do. I was trying to finish um, a new book. I'm halfway through it, but I had a deadline end of February to get so many words, like 56,000 words, to my editor. And that's a big deadline, so I had a big week, and I decided there'll be no little nightcaps and little little toddies of whiskey this week. And I'm here on my own in Donegal right in the way, so no drink. First night, powerful. Second morning, oh Jesus, I was up at like... Seven in the morning, flying away at the keyboard, happy as Larry writing the book. And I had such a good day on Tuesday that when it came to nine or ten o'clock that night, I wasn't tired. I'd work on and not only I wasn't, I was agitated and excited with the book. But it was by eleven or half eleven I decided to go to bed because that's what one does at night. Well, I could not sleep for the life of me. I was I was wrestling with angels in the bed all night. And, and I, I was so awake that on two occasions, maybe two o'clock and maybe later, at two o'clock, I really had to get up, make tea, and turn on the keyboard and the computer again and start looking at our bits and pieces on YouTube and thinking about philosophical ideas and ah got back to sleep then maybe at three or four o'clock and then five o'clock I'm awake again so wake the whole night so so last night I had a wonderful sleep so it, it varies and there can be ordinary normal things can keep you awake you know you can be kept awake by things that are annoying you You can be kept awake by things that are giving you joy. And in the old days, the monks used to, the monks used to always get up in the middle of the night. It's something I noticed that in every tradition, monks tended to get up in the middle of the night. And I noticed recently, you'll see scientists talking about the patterns of sleep, that there are different phases, and that to some extent, if you do break your sleep in the middle of the night, and then you go back into a deeper sleep, it's not the worst thing in the world. In fact, it might be good for you. And people talk about how before we got into clock time, before we got into industrial time, before we got into the nine to five time, many people lived in the night as well as in the daytime, you know. It was a time where the energy was from the moon, from dreams, from mystery. And so... It might be normal to get up in the middle of the night and walk around the house or sit looking out the window or sit at the embers of the fire. And they're they're amazingly beautiful places for, for a kind of meditation that I call dozing. You know, I, I, I think about meditation not just as what you do to still the mind into single pointed attention, but also what you do to respond to the way that that nature is communicating with you you know that you that you see yourself as you meditate in in something of a responsive mode to the well to what they would say in islam the face of god around you in nature the face of god is everywhere the gaze of god God looking at you is everywhere. And all you have to do is be still. Be still and let it be. Let let, let yourself be gazed at by God. It's not you that has to do the work to some extent. 
It's you that needs to respond. Let him be with you. Let him, let him love you. Let him touch you with the breath of the wind. Be there. Be there in that moment. It's, a, it's just the most amazing thing you'll ever experience. It is the embrace of God. So before clock time, and industrial time, I think people, they fell into that more smoothly, you know. Now we have to work at it. And I suppose what I'm saying is that we make an effort to work at meditation or concentration or prayer. And sometimes we make a ferocious fuss about prayer. Whether we're Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, sometimes we can really start grasping the right way to do it. And, and, and we grasp it so tightly. You know, we, we say to ourselves, I understand detachment. I understand how you must let go of all your attachments. So I've let go. Of that. So I, I know the truth now. I'm clear about it. And I'm going to meditate and just, you know, be absorbed by God. Theosis. I'm, I'm going to allow God's presence in everywhere. So, so I'm going to get up every morning and really work at this. And in some sense, you have it right. You have, you, you've got it right in your head. But you can be holding a very tight grip around these new ideas. And, and you'll always find people in Islam, Judaism or Christianity, you'll always find people who grip the truth, you know, the, the new salvation they have found, and they're gripping it so tightly that you feel they're about to hit you over the head with it. And the history of all religions will indeed show you that people have many, many times got clobbered over the head by religious zealots. I keep, I keep being in awe, you know, of the Gospels because once again, once again you find that Jesus had put his finger on a lot of that. And he puts it, his finger on it, not with some sort of ferocious anger, rage or accusation, but simply to, to show it up for what it is. And it happens in various ways in the Gospels, you know. Like when, when they come to stone the woman caught in sin. When we were young, we used to think, well, that's an ancient idea. You know, that, that's a kind of barbaric idea that you'd be stoning a woman to death because she was caught in sin. We used to think that. The 1960s, when, when we were children and heard it for the first time. But now we live in a world where that happens all the time. Back of a Toyota Jeep. And there she is being driven into some stadium. And there in the middle of the stadium are the stones. And you think, is this, is this possibly what's happening in the world we live in? And, and that's, not to, that's not to name that sort of zealotry as particular to any particular religion. Don't, don't fool yourself. You know, you'll get people in the West who, you know, point an accusatory finger at the more obvious versions of that in other religions. But but don't let don't be fooled because the barbar the the barbarous nature of a zealot is something that manifests in every culture and in every religion. You know, it happened in Auschwitz. 
it happened in Christianity. It still happens in Christianity. And it happened... Do you know what happened with Buddhism? There's lots of stories where Buddhist cultures had particularly zeal, zealous institutions and warriors and they went around tearing the heads off other people who didn't agree with their philosophy. So, you're always going to get it. You'll always have the poor, which is well. When Jesus said things like that, you know, is there nobody to condemn you? Well, I'm not going to condemn you. Or the poor, you'll always have with you. When he said things like that, he wasn't he wasn't being callous. He was being detached and wise. He was being a profound teacher. You know, because, because again, there's this trick all the time. If you're able to manage it, you will live a happy life. And it's this, that you don't grip your own way of looking at the world too tightly. I get so much richness out of what I believe is the truth about God's presence in my life. I, I get it when I, when I read Islam, when I read somebody like A. Helwa, H-E-L-W-A. She wrote a book called The Secrets of Divine Love. When I read that book, oh, it just uplifts me for the day. Or when I read the Psalms out of the Jewish tradition. It lifts me up so profoundly. Sometimes I read one Psalm, one Psalm, and I'm speaking like the words of the Psalm to God who's present with me. And it's like, it does me for a week. I remember it for days. Awake in the middle of the night, thinking about it. Phrases out of a particular one Psalm. I don't mean any one particular psalm. I mean any one of them, 150 of them. And obviously, there are moments when I participate in a ritual like the Eucharist and I acknowledge that, you know, my Lord and Master Jesus Christ is entering, embodying within me in communion and all those moments are moments of enormous joy. Enormous. I feel enormous gratefulness. And then and then I realize that the the psychologists tell me that gratefulness is a good attitude, that gratefulness will keep me healthy. And now I'm grateful for being grateful. And then I walk into a coffee shop and I sit down with somebody who doesn't believe a single thing, somebody who thinks that all religion is bad for you bad for everybody do I clobber them on the head do I do I grip my own faith tightly and tell them a thing or two no I genuinely try to think maybe you're right maybe this stuff works for me but that doesn't mean there's some absolute truth in it God is not a Catholic, God is not a Hindu, God is not a Muslim. But there are many languages that bring us into the presence of God, or rather that allow God to come to awaken us to the fact that he is present all the time. But never grip, never grip that truth too tightly. And I would say that that's where the sense of humor comes from. You know, like people who are zealous, people who are convinced about one argument or another, you'll not get much fun out of them. You'll find it coming up now. We have a eight days time. I think it's this day week. There's a referendum in Ireland. I'll not go into what it's about. It's about the Constitution, but anyway. It's a referendum, and there's two sides to the argument. And if you hear people discussing it, you will not find them laughing. 
And if you hear people talking about immigration, or if you hear people talking about Brexit, although people don't talk about that much now, but if you if you hear people talking about whether there should be, this is Ireland now, whether there should be a united Ireland or not. If you hear people talking about Donald Trump and Joe Biden, all those conversations, all those conversations are, they're just like terribly serious. And you don't get to laugh. You don't get a bit of fun into it if you're sitting around the dining table. People can get, they can, they can so identify with one particular point of view politically. It's, it's, it's far ahead of what the arguments they might have about religion. And maybe that's only because religion is, is in decline at an institutional level. But certainly, gosh, the way people talk politics. I know, I'll tell you this, I always say this when I'm on stage. When I'm doing a, a theatre show, I always say, if you want to have fun, you want to be happy, you have a dinner party, and you invite your friends, and you go to Dunn stores, and you get the, the corn-fed chicken, and you get the 20 euro bottle of good Bordeaux wine, and you come home, and you set the whole thing up, and the people come and they sit around the table. And then, when you're just starting into it, or halfway through the lovely meal, you open your gob like an idiot and say something like, well, what do you think of the referendum? Or what do you think of Joe Biden? Or what do you think of, you know, some war? And the minute you do it, you have divided the table. The minute you do it, you have ruined all the effort you put into the chicken, the cooking, the wine, because you've divided everybody into two camps. And the mood will change, and it'll never, it'll, it'll, ha- it'll not heal during that dinner. You'll be out in the kitchen, if you were me, like, and the lady and wife, it'd be looking at you, making the coffee and saying, you fucking idiot, you. What did you have to raise that subject for? Now, I learned that, I would say, 30 years ago, and it was my beloved partner who taught it to me, like, because you'd realise there was too many... I was, we were at too many dinner tables where I'd come away thinking, I'm an awful gobshite. Because I started that argument. I was so, I was so stupid that I used to think that it was a good idea to have arguments. I, I actually used to go to the dinner table and I'd be bored with the trivial gossip and I'd be sitting waiting for the argument to start. I'd have me, you know, knife sharpened under my arm to have the argument. And I, I think I learned, I'm now 70 years of age, so between 30 and 70, that's 40 years, I learned, don't talk politics. Don't divide people, because what happens is they grip, they grip their own position so tightly there's no space for humour or comedy. And everybody comes away from the table unhappy. And what I know now is that y- you will get the same in relation to religion. It's slightly different because in religion it's like not an argument about the right and wrong. It's more like somebody preaching. It's more like somebody being evangelical. It's somebody looking in your eyes and telling you how how wonderful their particular take on religion is. You know that that it's it's really they mightn't say I have the right religion, but they just kind of push it down your gullet. And I I think that's not good for them. It's not that they're going to start a, an argument at the table, but but you're not. If you grip the idea of God too tightly, you're actually not letting God in. Because because God is not there when you reach out. God is there when you let go. I know people use that phrase, 
you don't reach out for God. Okay, it's a good phrase, but I'd prefer open your heart and let God in. Do you remember the old picture there used to be when we were kids? It was an old sort of 19th century nostalgic picture, and it was Jesus, and he has a lamp in his hand, and he's standing outside the door. And it, it, it used to say, the caption was, I am waiting outside the door of your heart. You must let me in, but the handle is only on the inside. So in some way, one of the mysteries of, of this relationship we have with God and with God's presence is that reaching out to God is is just letting him in. It's if you stop doing everything. If you stop all the ways that you're striving to reach God. Just stop them. Then you'll find that he comes in and is present with you. And that's why it, even though it's paradoxical, it can sometimes be very, very true that letting go of Letting go of religious behavior is sometimes a way of opening out, you know. And I find that a great helpful practice. People probably would say that I'm inconsistent in my religious practice because I don't do it absolutely regularly all the time. Well, I do at a deep level of what I would say is my my turning to God. So, so if I turn to God in my baptism, in my bar mitzvah, in my confirmation, in in the first time I walk into a mosque, in the first time I take refuge in a, a teacher as a Buddhist, whatever way that I, I make a fundamental statement about my life, this is the context within which I will live. I will live as a Christian. I will live as a Buddhist. Okay, then that's the way I do it. But in order not to make it into a habit, in order not to make it into some sort of routine like I'm in an army. I sometimes let go of everything. Uh, just to see what happens. I take a holiday. I take a holy day. And I noticed one time I was in a monastery in, in, in Venice, believe it or not was on the Lido in Venice and I just ended up in it accidentally myself and John O'Donoghue the Lord bless that wise and great man John O'Donoghue and the wonderful and rich and friendship that I had with him when we were students in Maynooth And I lost contact with him for probably 15 years before he passed away. And I was so, so sad about that. And shocked when he died so terribly young in his 50s. And how he would be needed now. And don't forget his books. Don't forget to, to go find him on the internet. When I, when I go to YouTube, you know, and I... I'd see John giving a lecture from 50, 20 years ago. It, it, it's just amazing how his presence is almost still still with me. And I remember those blessed days that I had with him in friendship. And as I say, we ended up in a monastery in Venice in the Lido. We were just we were adventuring out to see the world, you know. And it was the first place, this this monastery in, on the Lido in Venice, it was the first place where I saw brandy being poured on ice cream. I was 30 years of age. It was 
a concept that I did not have before that moment. Brandy on ice cream. Great way to take your ice cream, and it's a great way to take your brandy. But we were doing it. We were in this big refectory where all the monks were, you know, sitting at long board, bare board tables in, against the four walls. So the middle of the space was empty except for a table where they would come in and leave the food on the table. And then the monks and us two were sitting against the wall where the seats were. So the, these seats, long tables, went all around the four walls. And everybody sat with their back to the wall. And so they were able to have a conversation, maybe 40 monks in the in the refectory, but they were able to have one single conversation very similar to what what you would see in a parliament. Because because the way the tables were situated, it was like one single table. And they were conversing away in Italian. I didn't know what they were talking about. But they all seemed very jolly and laughing. And, and sometimes one of them would be so energetic in his conversation that he'd kind of stand up behind his table to dramatically like, a, like an orator in in the Parliament in London or something. And that went on every day. We were there for about two weeks. But it went on every day at the meal time, which was usually, as far as I remember, it was lunchtime and then there was no... There was, there was nothing else. I think people might have, the monks might have gone and had a little bit of supper, as like individually, but that was their collective, one collective meal of the day. And it was all fine until Sunday and the meal went as normal like each person for example would go up with their bowl to the center and put in what they want like you might do in a hotel at your breakfast time nowadays and then they would come back and they'd sit in their place and they would take with them not just water but a half carafe of wine every monk took a half carafe of wine with his lunch and I thought, well, that's impressive. I like that sort of idea. The drinking monk. So anyway, that goes on. And then on Sunday, the food is a little bit more elegant. I can't remember now what we were eating. Probably during the week we had had mostly pasta and salad and maybe it was some kind of roast on the Sunday, but I, I can't really remember. What I do remember is that when we were coming to what I presumed was the conclusion, out came the dessert. And I was surprised and delighted with that. So I says to myself, the, the monks have a dessert on a Sunday. That's something special. But then along came one of the monks in his sandals and his long brown robes and a bottle of brandy in either hand like or milk churns. And he went round the whole forty monks, pouring brandy on the ice cream. Until by the time he got round the full circle, there was, there was no more brandy left in the two bottles. And I thought, that's beautiful. There was something so symbolically generous and yet understated. There was something like saying, Christ is risen, but let's not be too excited. But here's what we'll do. Here's the ritual. And you knew that that happened every, every Sunday and every Holy Day. And it gave me a great feeling of, of what a Sunday should be, of joy and celebration. But like relaxed, you know, not kind of again gripping the celebration. That's another thing people do, even when they go to celebrate something. Suppose, and for example, I was at a, a birthday event during the week, last weekend, which is the reason why I decided this week I wasn't going to take any drink for a few nights. But last weekend I was at a, a birthday celebration and before it happened, the the person who was organising it 
but two days beforehand I was talking to them on the phone and I said, how are you feeling? And they said, oh, I'm a bit worn out, you know, I'm a bit nervous. Uh, I'm, I'm worried about, you know, they were worried about the food. Would the food be good? Would it be nice? Would it be organised well? Would they have enough booze? And would people come? So, so in other words, they were, they were having a celebration but they were even putting more effort into the celebration than they normally put into an ordinary day. And that kind of happens in the next two months all around the country. The bouncy, the bouncy castles will be up and out and people will be organising First Holy Communions. And I think that's absolutely lovely. I love to see them bouncy castles. I love to see huge gatherings of people dressed up to the 90 coming out of church doors all over the country with First Holy Communions. I just love it. I think because I think it's culture and I think it's positive and it's joyful and it gives us a way to celebrate and to celebrate among families. Sure, it's gorgeous. But I know there's also going to be some people in those in those parties organising them who will be stressed out, worn out, because they're worrying too much or cooking too much or or having too much anxiety about the cost of it. You know? So all the time, I suppose, this morning I keep coming back to this sense of of how to take on faith, how to take on your religion. And I'm just sharing with you that I do have this deep sense that when you practice something like Buddhism, Christianity, most Islam, whatever, that you practice it, you get richness from it, but then sometimes find spaces to let go, to actually let go of it. Give yourself a break, as they'd say. And, and that break, funny enough, corresponds to the old medieval tradition of a holiday, a holy day. And you get it in, in Judaism, in the Shabbat, the Sabbath. Why, why are the rules and regulations in relation to Shabbat, the, the Sabbath, the holy day in Judaism? Why is it? That they have all these things, you say, you know, you you shouldn't travel, you shouldn't work, you shouldn't, you shouldn't turn on lights, you know, you shouldn't use electricity. Like it's so, if you were really now crazy ultra orthodox Jew, you'd be just sitting there looking out the window for twenty four hours. You wouldn't be able to do anything. But, but why is it that you take this big break? And, and they do it in, they don't do it. No, they don't do it in the West now. And they don't do it. We don't do it in Ireland. We don't take that break on the Sunday the way we used to. You know, the shops are open. We go sh- That's okay. I mean, it's it's the way we live. I like it. I like shopping. I love big malls in Warsaw and Dunlow and places. It's great. Letter Kenny. But the old way of doing Shabbat, the Holy Day, the Sunday in Christianity, was to stop doing the normal things you do. Why? Because if you just be still, you will experience God's presence. And that's why meditation is not a doing of something. Why prayer is not a doing of something. It's a letting go of everything. It's not so much reaching out to God as stopping what you're doing so that God can come in. And be present. It's 
It's not the music you make that is beautiful. It's not the music you make that will let you find God. It's the space between the notes. That's what's beautiful. That's where you'll find God's presence. And the two big ways that this idea fits in for me this morning. One is in relation to that first story of you know, the young monk and the old monk and, and the young fella, he's carrying something with him. The old monk took the young woman across the river and then for an hour afterwards, young monk and old monk, he's not talking and eventually he says to the old fella, you took her across the river, that's against the rules. He's working at being a good monk, okay. And what does the old fella say? He says, well, you know, I let her down an hour ago, but you're still carrying her. You're gripping, you're gripping the rule too tightly. You're gripping your truth too tightly. You're being too zealous about what you experience as your truth. Let go of it. Give yourself a break, as they say. Give yourself a break. Give yourself a Shabbat. Give yourself Sunday. Imagine you're living in the 19th century and you have a day off everything. You want to do no. You don't even want to read the paper. You want to just sit and be still. And when you get that stillness, not only not only does sort of things that you didn't resolve in the past, they they will they will oh they'll show their head immediately. If you have anger about something, or you know you're living like you're living as if like in a dream when you do that. As if like in a dream. John Moriarty used to talk about that. I think he was quoting some of the psychologists, I'm not sure, but he used to he used to say, you know, or quote somebody who said, When when we look out we are dreaming, when we look within we wake up. In in the solitude of your own heart you experience a presence which is God within you. And then look out. And don't take what's out there as some sort of literal reality that you can name as real. Take it as if like in a dream. All phenomena as like a dream, a Buddhist text says. And so you get to this stage where you let go. I'm going to do this now for this weekend. And and I'd be so joyful <laughs> if you would share it with me, you know. Be with me. Trust me that when I finish up here and I drive to Leitrim, between this evening, I love Friday evening because it is Shabbat. It is the it is the time where in Judaism you cease and stop everything and be still. And this is in all traditions, from Buddhist to the three traditions of the Holy Book in the West. There has to be the moment where you are still and you realize that no matter how you reach out, it's not, it's not the link. The link is that God is reaching out to you. He's at the door. He's knocking. He wants to come in. And then you're living a moment of responsiveness. 
you're, you're, you're living a moment of passivity. And that has a, a huge effect on your life because as you grow older, your detachment becomes settled into Sunday. Your detachment settles into Shabbat. Even the ultimate journey towards death. Heavy subject, I won't go into it too deeply, but just just to touch on a, a little moment, that when I see the certainty of my death, my mortality is the same as yours. In a hundred years, I won't be here and you won't be here. So somewhere along this road, and for me at 70, it won't be a huge m- mega distance away. Somewhere along that road, I meet my final day, my death. And my prayer would be that in that moment you realize the absoluteness of death is the opportunity of death. The absoluteness of death is the complete letting go. It is the complete Sunday. It is the complete Shabbat. It is the complete letting everything be still and drifting, not just away from your work, not just away from your concerns and your anxieties, but but every aspect of your your conscious physical embodiment, letting it go with the trust and experience that you are being absorbed by God into love. It's like a, a non-dualism That we strive, you know, we strive for non-duality all the time. We strive for that sense of having a consciousness and compassion that's wider than our own ego. And and this is this is what you're gifted in the moment of death. To fall asunder, to fall into the abyss, to fall into the arms of your God. That's the way it looks to me. And that's one great benefit of practicing Sunday, practicing Shabbat, practicing, maybe we call it the weekend, you know. Maybe the weekend is is what has become for our culture because we have this very sectionalized way of working since the Industrial Revolution. So maybe that's the way to do it. But one way or another, when you let go, and not just let go of your work, not just let go of your anxiety, but let go sometimes of your faith, your faith practice, your religion, your your philosophy, even, even in a secular way. Just try and get outside everything and just be. Take a break. Let go and let God, we used to, I remember it used to be on posters when I was young. There was a story, the, the elephant. I wrote a book called Hanging with the Elephant, and I got the the title comes from a, there was a poster way back in the 70s, and it was an elephant, and he had fallen over a cliff, and he was hanging on. He was clinging by his trunk. It was wrapped around a daisy. And there he is hanging from the daisy, this elephant, and he's praying. And he's saying, oh God, help me. And God says to him, do you believe in me? And the elephant says, I do. And God says, let go of the daisy. So, I hope you have a good weekend. I hope you have a wonderful rest. I like doing these on a Friday because it it like sets up the weekend for me. 
as a meditation. And I think that when you start to let go, when you start to find a physical space and a time space where you can just let go of everything and it doesn't mean like I'm letting go of my work so I'll you know read the bible or I'm letting go of my work so I'll do more buddhist meditation no just just let go of everything everything you will become a nuisance to your children a nuisance to your husband or your wife or your partner or whatever because you'll be walking around and be saying what are you doing you're under my feet. Ah, then go outside and walk around the garden. And don't do the garden. Just just take a couple of hours or a day, 24 hours. Or, again, you know the way people take a break for the weekend and then Saturday morning, they're up at 8 o'clock going to the garden centre to get the Wellingtons because I have to put in them roses today. It's the 1st of March. need to put them in. And it's like they've just trans, transferred the gripping of things. So all week they're gripping anxieties about their work and then they go on what they call a weekend and they, they're gripping new anxieties about you know where the weeds might be and where to plant the roses. I know you'd say I'm a very lazy person. I am a very lazy person. I doze by the fire and I walk in the garden and do nothing. Just experience being there in the present moment in the garden. There's nothing as good because you're opening the door and you're allowing the wonderful and mysterious eternal presence of God to touch you. So thank you for being here. And have a wonderful weekend.